is it likely that we citizens would then argue much about the extent of the franchise? Under these circumstances, is it likely that the extent of the right to vote would endanger that supreme good, the public peace? Is it likely that excluded classes would refuse to peaceably await the coming of their right to vote? Is it likely that those who had the right to vote would jealously defend their privilege? If the law were confined to its proper functions, everyone's interest in the law would be the same. Is it not clear that under these circumstances, those who voted could not inconvenience those who did not vote? But on the other hand, imagine that this fatal principle had been introduced. Under the pretense of organization, regulation, protection, or encouragement, the law takes property from one person and gives it to another. The law takes the wealth of all and gives it to a few, whether farmers, manufacturers, ship owners, artists, or comedians. Under these circumstances, then certainly every class will aspire to grasp the law, and logically so. The excluded classes will furiously demand their right to vote and will overthrow society rather than not to obtain it. Even beggars and vagabonds will then prove to you that they also have an incontestable title to vote. They will say to you, we cannot buy wine, tobacco, or salt without paying the tax. And as a part of the tax that we pay is given by law in privileges and subsidies to men who are richer than we are. Others use the law to raise the prices of bread, meat, iron, or cloth. Thus, since everyone else uses the law for his own profit, we also would like to use the law for our own profit. We demand from the law the right to relief, which is the poor man's plunder. To obtain this right, we also should be voters and legislators, in order that we may organize beggary on a grand scale for our own class, as you have organized protection on a grand scale for your class. Now don't tell us beggars that you will act for us and then toss us, as Mr. Mimorel proposes, 600,000 francs to keep us quiet, like throwing us a bone to gnaw. We have other claims. And anyway, we wish to bargain for ourselves as other classes have bargained for themselves. And what can you say to answer that argument? As long as it is admitted that the law may be diverted from its true purpose, that it may violate property instead of protecting it, then everyone will want to participate in making the law, either to protect himself against plunder or to use it for plunder. Political questions will always be prejudicial, dominant, and all-absorbing. There will be fighting at the door of the legislative palace, and the struggle within will be no less furious. To know this, it is hardly necessary to examine what transpires inside the legislature. Merely to understand the issue is to know the answer. Is there any need to offer proof that this odious perversion of the law is a perpetual source of hatred and discord, that it tends to destroy society itself? If such proof is needed, look at the United States in this year of 1850. There is no country in the world where the law is kept more within its proper domain, the protection of every person's liberty and property. As a consequence of this, there appears to be no country in the world where the social order rests on a firmer foundation. But even in the United States, there are two issues, and only two, that have always endangered the public peace. What are these two issues? They are slavery and tariffs. These are the only two issues where, contrary to the general spirit of the Republic of the United States, law has assumed the character of a plunderer. Slavery is a violation by law of liberty. The protective tariff is a violation by law of property. It is a most remarkable fact that this double legal crime, the sorrowful inheritance from the old world, should be the only issue which can and perhaps will lead to the ruin of the Union. It is indeed impossible to imagine at the very heart of a society a more astounding fact than this. The law has come to be an instrument of injustice. And if this fact brings terrible consequences to the United States, where the proper purpose of the law has been perverted only in the instances of slavery and tariffs, what must be the consequences in Europe, where the perversion of the law is a principle, a system? Mr. de Montalibert, a politician and writer, adopting the thought contained in a famous proclamation by Mr. Carlier, has said, 
we must make war against socialism. According to the definition of socialism advanced by Mr. Charles Dupin, he meant we must make war against plunder. But of what plunder was he speaking? For there are two kinds of plunder, legal and illegal. I do not think that illegal plunder, such as theft or swindling, which the penal code defines, anticipates, and punishes, can be called socialism. It is not this kind of plunder that systematically threatens the foundation of society. Anyway, the war against this kind of plunder has not waited for the command of these gentlemen. The war against illegal plunder has been fought since the beginning of the world, long before the revolution of February 1848, long before the appearance even of socialism itself. France had provided police, judges, gendarmes, prisons, dungeons, and scaffolds for the purpose of fighting illegal plunder. The law itself conducts this war, and it is my wish and opinion that the law should always maintain this attitude toward plunder. But it does not always do this. Sometimes the law defends plunder and participates in it. Thus the beneficiaries are spared the shame, danger, and scruple which their acts would otherwise involve. Sometimes the law places the whole apparatus of judges, police, prisons, and gendarmes at the service of the plunderers and treats the victim when he defends himself as a criminal. In short, there is a legal plunder, and it is of this, no doubt, that Mr. de Montalembert speaks. This legal plunder may be only an isolated stain among the legislative measures of the people. If so, it is best to wipe it out with a minimum of speeches and denunciations and in spite of the uproar of the vested interests. But how is this legal plunder to be identified? Quite simple. See if the law takes from some persons what belongs to them and gives it to other persons to whom it does not belong. See if the law benefits one citizen at the expense of another by doing what the citizen himself cannot do without committing a crime. Then abolish this law without delay. For it is not only an evil itself, but also it is a fertile source for further evils because it invites reprisals. If such a law, which may be an isolated case, is not abolished immediately, it will spread, multiply, and develop into a system. The person who profits from this law will complain bitterly, defending his acquired rights. He will claim that the state is obligated to protect and encourage his particular industry that this procedure enriches the state because the protected industry is thus able to spend more and to pay higher wages to the poor working man. Do not listen to this sophistry by vested interests. The acceptance of these arguments will build legal plunder into a whole system. In fact, this already has occurred. The present-day delusion is an attempt to enrich everyone at the expense of everyone else, to make plunder universal under the pretense of organizing it. Now, legal plunder can be committed in an infinite number of ways. Thus, we have an infinite number of plans for organizing it. Tariffs, protection, benefits, subsidies, encouragements, progressive taxation, public schools, guaranteed jobs, guaranteed profits, minimum wages, a right to relief, a right to the tools of labor, free credit, and so on and so on. All these plans as a whole with their common aim of legal plunder, constitute socialism. Now, since under this definition, socialism is a body of doctrine, what attack can be made against it other than a war of doctrine? If you find this socialistic doctrine to be false, absurd, and evil, then refute it. And the more false, the more absurd, and the more evil it is, the easier it will be to refute. Above all, if you wish to be strong, Begin by rooting out every particle of socialism that may have crept into your legislation. This will be no light task. Mr. de Montalembert has been accused of desiring to fight socialism by the use of brute force. He ought to be exonerated from this accusation, for he has plainly said, the war that we must fight against socialism must be in harmony with law, honor, and justice. But why does not Mr. Montalembert see that he has placed himself in a vicious circle? You would use the law to oppose socialism, but it is upon the law that socialism itself relies. Socialists desire to practice legal plunder, not illegal plunder. Socialists, like all other monopolists, 
desire to make the law their own weapon